Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Mark Watts and Aidan Oakley. Thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we have a double call, three call. Yeah, so we've got two people on the line. We've got Aiden and we've got Mark. So firstly, thanks for tuning in in your different time zones. Really appreciate your time. And welcome to the podcast, both of you. Uh, cheers for having me, Rob. Yeah, thanks for having me, on, Rob. I appreciate it. Appreciate it's the time you. as well. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great one to be up for. But. <laughs> You're all right. You go to bed later. <laughs> so obviously the reason, um, well, the kind of discussion around today is going to be uh, the, the two articles that you, uh, firstly, the two articles that you wrote, Mark, probably going back um, for a year, 18 months, and obviously the more recent one that, um, that Aidan wrote. Firstly, do you want to kind of remind people um, what them articles were and then maybe a little well first little introduction into yourselves and then maybe why each of you wrote the articles that you did um maybe aiden you go first yeah so um the intro about me is obviously i'm an snc coach out in qatar um at the aspire academy um previously to that i've been uh, an intern at a scholarship in rugby league i've interned in america i interned back in rugby league got a job in rugby league, lost a job in rugby league, was, was out of work for a couple of months, got a job in Scotland at the Institute of Sport, left that to join Exos in the Middle East and then that finished and was out of work for a couple more months and then obviously landed the job out here at Aspire, which I'm, I'm currently in now. Um, I guess in terms of the article I wrote, um, it sort of springboarded off the back of the UKSA conference this year. Um, where they presented, obviously, the findings of the, the State of the Nation survey that they carried out. And like, everyone's probably seen it now. It's been on Twitter. It's been in my article. And it wasn't necessarily pretty reading for the most part. Um, I wouldn't say too much of it was shocking. But it just almost confirmed a lot of, I guess, what we in the industry know is going on. Um, and then in terms of writing the article, it was a case of, I was having the same conversations with different people and the same ideas just kept coming up and you know I thought if I'm having these conversations in my circle then obviously I'm imagining people in other circles having the same conversations um, and I just kind of got fed up of having the same conversation without being able to get anywhere so I thought you know what I'll put my thoughts down on paper um, I'll put them out there people can have a read and hopefully it's, it, it acts as a springboard to kind of drive our profession I don't want to say in the right direction. I think it's, it's headed in the right direction at the minute. But I think it's starting to drift off course, maybe, or probably not going as quickly as it could. Um, so hopefully it will just accelerate it into, into where it should be going, I think. So very quickly, what were them conversations that you were having? Oh, I guess, obviously, a lot of sort of debate goes on about unpaid internships, um, obviously the lack of clarity around, I guess, job roles, job responsibilities, salaries, um, career progressions, how to get into the industry. Um, and, and again, like I'm still reasonably new into the profession. I think I've been coaching for five, six years and obviously in a similar position to you where, you know, we're probably that second generation of S&C coaches coming through where S&C is legitimately a profession to work in. It's a degree that you can study at undergrad at master's. And I think we're really that first wave of, you know, coming through this phase where we've got our undergrad degrees, we've got our master's, we've got our experience, and we weren't being able to get roles that would pay us or pay respectable wages. Um, and I think it was a, a lot of frustration that, you know, guys are potentially having to do two, three, four years unpaid internships just to get considered for jobs or they're getting turned away from internships and not having enough experience. And, you know, the jobs that, you know, I was finding myself applying for 
were asking for three, four years experience, a master's degree, you know, everything else under the sun, but they're going to pay you, you know, 18,000 pounds if you're lucky. And like, obviously I'm from just outside London, trying to live in London on that, you know, it's just not viable. And it, a part of it's frustration, but part of me is I want to steer it in the right direction. And, you know, I think I've had enough conversations with people that have been in the same position to know that it's an issue we need to address. Um, and hopefully that's kind of just sort of started to, to peel away the layers surrounding that. Was that similar for you, Mark? Do you want to give us a little bit of an intro on you? Yeah, you know, I, I, the the parallels are uncanny between, first of all, uh, you know, Aiden's article, if anybody hasn't read it, I suggest to do so because he really took a lot of time and a lot of data. And I think the difference between Aiden's article and the one that I tried to read, most of mine was anecdotal and, and his was just really getting the, 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 the feedback from a lot of people in the profession. So uh, I would suggest anybody that, that you, you really have – you really be able to see a lot of parallels. And, you know, the second point is, uh, you know, this seems to be a global issue because th there's, when you talk to coaches, um, whether it be from the States or overseas for us, um, you know, it really is um, this problem, this issue that we're, the challenges that we're dealing with really aren't just uh, a college strength and conditioning, although that's what most people in the States concentrate on. It goes further than that, and I think that that's really, you know, there is kind of a, a, an issue. Um, so really to see the parallels and, like, read the article and listen to Aiden talk, um, it just seems like I'm shaking my head saying, yes, you know, going through the same thing. You have the same conversation with the same coaches year in and year out, and like I said, I got my start in strength and conditioning. Um, you know, I was, I was uh, when I graduated high school, I went to the United States Marine Corps, I got out, I walked on, I played college football, and I, I wanted to get into coaching, and I like being able to coach, you know, American football and strength and conditioning at the same time. And what I found out was that, you know, you really, the, the game has changed a little bit. Uh, and again, the number one thing that has changed it for positive and for sometimes uh, makes things a little more challenging is the social media aspect. Um, when I started my first year of coaching was 1998, and when I started then, you know, there was some, um, you know, if you wanted to get some information from other coaches, you had to go and travel to go see them. You had to go to their gym, you had to go to the university, you had to watch and be there hands on. Um, you know, the, there wasn't really people writing, there was a couple publications here and there, but there was nothing online really. Um, and I think what happens is now is that we have so much information. Uh, and I think the challenge now for young strength coaches to be able to process that, be able to filter what is applicable, what is not. And I think sometimes that um, that, be, that tends to be a challenge because at the end of the day, and Aiden touched on this, uh, you know, as many degrees as you have and as many certifications you have, and I'm not saying that a degree or a certification will guarantee you a job, but it sure can make sure that you don't get that job. Uh, those are the necessary evils that you have to have. Um, and, and I know that, you know, we, we both talked about that in previous articles. Um, and the, the thing that is the difference is that, you know, again, when you said that, I mean, I've had, I've literally had coaches that have done, again, four or five unpaid internships. And we have coaches that are, number one, we have job postings that are requiring a master's degree for an unpaid internship. Because that is how you, that is how you filter, and that is how you, because, and they'll get them, they'll get those kind of, they'll, they'll get those overqualified coaches. Um, and so you have overqualified coaches that have a very sour, sour taste in their mouth because they're, they're, they're way more qualified for the job they have, but that's the job that, because of supply and demand, that's the job where they're at. Um, you know, we have, you know, some people are taking an unpaid internship just to have another unpaid internship at a larger school university where they do less. <laughs> so you do the unpaid internship at a small, you know, in, in the States, you know, Division three school, Division two school, to get another unpaid internship so you have a better logo on your shirt, but you're going to do less, you're going to coach less. And that's hopefully going to as many, if you can just keep adding lines in the resume, maybe you got a shot. If you can keep getting some letters of recommendations, maybe you have a shot. But, the, you know, that all goes back to the reason why I wrote the article was because I think we were avoiding 
especially here in the States, we were avoiding the actual core problem. We were, we were complaining about, and it was easier for me because when I stepped away from coaching in 2013, was able to for, for write for Lead FTS, and I was able to kind of step back and see the forest through the trees. So I was able to kind of have a little bit more perspective. But the one thing that we were complaining about, how many hours we worked, how much money we weren't making, how there was no job security, but those were all byproducts of the underlying problem. And for me, when I, if I had to narrow it down to one line, it was that for our profession, no one has really figured out a way to objectively quantify the strength and conditioning position. No one has come up with a way to say, okay, you are a better strength coach than coach A is a better strength coach than coach B, and here's why. It is so subjective. And all of a sudden, if we can't determine that in our own profession, the people that are paying us to do what we do, they surely don't, don't understand the difference between Coach A and Coach B, and the difference between and why, what in our job responsibilities actually have an impact on the field or court. And I think that was the problem. That, so we had to get through all this BS of complaining that we need to make more, we need to do this, and it's like, if you put yourself, if you have some empathy and put yourself in the administrator's position or the gym owner's position or the high school principal's position, you will know that, again, for them, all of the things that we pride ourselves on to make us look like we're making a difference, they may or may not value. And that was where the problem came in. And then I wrote part two because I came up with a problem. We identified the problem, but I really didn't. I wasn't, you know, coming up with any solutions. And I didn't want to sound like someone that's just ranting because we have enough of that in our profession. I wanted to come up with something like, okay, what can we do to start to get to that? And I don't know if it's going to be a solution, but we have to get in, in, in articles like Aiden's and what he's done. Uh, is, is, and, and, and the fact that, you know, Rob, with your with podcast, getting that information out there, those that's a start. But the people that are paying the money and hiring strength coaches aren't even, not only do they not know, but they don't really want to be in the know. And, and that's where the problem starts, I think. Just to sorry, jump on the, the back of that, Mark, obviously the, the second article of yours that you put out was the, almost the catalyst for, for my one and you know, almost prompted me to get my thoughts down on paper and exactly the same reasons I think you've said there is you know, try and make people aware of it and you know, put it in the forefront. And the one thing that really stuck out of, of your one for me was obviously saying we're a, pro, a processed based profession in an outcome based system and you know you say how do you grade S&C coaches and judge different programs I think you touched on it again in, in your article saying you know where does recruitment come into this and you know there's so many factors that we can't account for and you're almost left on a whim at times to you know get a job or keep a job and it's that difficult one until we nail down exactly you know what we do and how we quantify it. I think we're going to continue to struggle uh, to struggle um, but again, you, you talk about guys going from internship to internship. Um, as long as people are willing to work for free and you know to get that slightly better bit of kit or to work with that slightly better team, even if it means doing less, I think it, it sets the bar pretty low, and then yeah. everything sort of stoops to that level. As opposed to you know what I'm hopefully trying to do with this is you know raise the minimum, and so that everyone up the chain you know reaps the benefit of it you know if people are working free at the bottom well that just lowers our worth at the top and you know if you're getting paid you know people are going to go why am i going to pay you x y and z when people are willing to work for free i'll pay you half of what you're on and it's like the, the thing for me that i struggle with is a, a lot of obviously older more experienced coaches um are the ones turning around nowadays and going well i worked for free um therefore you should all work for free but i'm like if everyone works for free, you're shooting yourself in the foot because then people are going to pay you less and it doesn't do us as a profession any good, you know, in the long term. It just devalues what we're trying to do and, you know, I think as a profession we can do a lot of good with the programs we work in. Yeah, and you, you touched on that with just the devaluing. I mean, you, essentially, young people are paying to coach and the biggest mistake I made when I was coaching, when I brought interns on was that, bring on an intern so they can train a team. And not only they're not qualified to do that, but I'm asking someone to do something they're not qualified to do and not even paying them to do it. And I wasn't even taking the time to teach them. 
and it was uh, it was a frustrating process. Probably the biggest disservice I made to the people that work for me and you know the, the profession itself was you know the fact that um, you know I wasn't really it wasn't a, a, a educational process. The internship wasn't an educational process. The internship was a hey you know this is a pay your due process and and, uh, and ultimately you're exactly right. It it downgraded the profession and people should know you know the best strength coaches that I've known, that I've interacted with, that I talked to, uh, have all been fired at one point. And I know that um, my good friend Todd Hammer had asked the question, on, and if I'm, I'm misquoting, uh, forgive me, but he asked the question at one of the NSCA uh, coaches conferences and the CSCCA, which are the two main ones um, in terms of strength and conditioning in the States here, um, you know, how many people do you know that really retired as a strength coach? You know, and you would be amazed how many hands don't go up. Um, you know, because, and again, everybody's either going to get out like I did, um, you know, that you last as long as you can to it till, till you can't anymore, or, you know, you end up getting let go and then you have to find another, another pace. And, and that's not, that's not a good outcome. You know, that's not a good, that's not a good system to be proud of. Um, and so you're right. Those older coaches, I think have to take some responsibility, uh, as well. Uh, I just, that, that was, that was sorry, Rob, next point. obviously you're still there. Sorry. Um, Sorry, mate. Sorry, I was just going to, again, why are you here? We'll just have this conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, just to jump on the back of those two points. <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> Sorry, Rob, I told you this would just be a rant. Um, but I, I guess, obviously, two points you made there is obviously not many people are retiring. I think it just highlights just how young our profession is. I think, obviously, uh -huh. the NSCA has been around almost, I think, 40 years UKCA is only 12, so it's still a relatively young profession there. So I think we are going to have teething issues and I think we're still going to grow, but, you know, hopefully we can accelerate that. And I think obviously on the other point you made there, Mark, about internships programs and people working for free and not being qualified, like, I don't want this to come across as there shouldn't be internships or I want to call them student placements, you know. You still have to, you know, earn your stripes and be able to coach and get that experience. I don't think... Well, I don't want people to get be under the illusion that they're going to graduate with an undergrad degree and maybe coached you know, one or two years and then walk into job straight away if they're not qualified. I think the own, owner still lies on, on the practitioner to make sure they are qualified and experienced going into the role. Otherwise, like for me, I didn't decide until my last year of my undergrad degree that I went to get into s &C. So I was already behind the eight balls. I did a year's unpaid internship. I went to America for three months and worked unpaid out there and paid my flights. But I got that experience and, you know, I didn't expect to have it hand to me. But if I'd have known earlier and started, you know, my first or second year at university when I'm getting a student loan and not having to worry about bills, then, yeah, I'd, I'd have hoped to have got into a job sooner. So it's not all everything is going to be hunky-dory rosy for you. You know, people are still going to have to go through that process, but it, it needs to be an educational one. And again, obviously, I had Rich Clark from the University of Gloucester followed on my blog post with his and I was chatting right. to him about, you know, there needs to be a student um, pathway or placement pathway that, you know, guides students that, you know, if you are going to go through an internship, you know, this needs to be an educational process. You need to be learning. There needs to be reviews. There needs to be outcomes. And it can't just be free labor. You know, you have to leave there a better practitioner that can coach, that's learned on the job skills that universities don't teach you. And I don't think they should have to. But I think you have to marry up the degree and real life experience. And I think that just needs to be a reality check for some people. And I'm not all, you know, pro, don't work for free. You know, it, it, that's the reality of what we're working. But when you get people working for three or four years, just hanging in there, waiting for that chance, it's like, you know, at some point you've got to accept that maybe it's not for you. Um, and yeah, maybe find a... a a profession that does suit you is it the responsibility of the young coaches to say i'm not working for free not obviously i know what you're saying there aid about our oh, mark about you do have to go through that process to a certain extent but it can't be four five six years you can't be 25 and still working for nothing but is it the responsibility of the coach the young coaches who are desperate to work in professional football, NFL, NBA, whatever it may be, or is there a responsibility from universities, uh, governing bodies, um, UKSCA, ASCA, NSCA, to do something about it? 
That's a really interesting question, and I, I think it's a. I, I think everybody would probably agree that it has to be some kind of a combined responsibility. Um, you know, I think if you're if you're if you're a head strength and conditioning coach and you have an internship program, a lot of them here to stay stay pawned off to the first assistant and they're in charge of it. Um, but I think those coaches have to have some kind of responsibility because when someone asks, okay, where did you coach before? It's always going to come back to it's always going to come back to you. So those 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 athletes or those those coaches are prepared. Um, I think it's it's important for those coaches to take a responsibility, and I think that you know for for the most part. That is, for me, I think that any head strength and conditioning coach that takes on an intern should be able to give them every single bit of experience, all their mistakes, um, and I think the, the most important thing is to be able to have the time to uh, give them some evaluated experience. That's something that, that, that John Maxwell started. It's not about experience. It's, it's about evaluated experience. I spent a long time coaching, being the only strength coach on a small staff, and I was by myself with 23 sports. And, and you know what? As much as I tried to talk to people, as much as I tried to go and network, the only way I really got better, or I know I got better, was when I invited people to come and evaluate me and how I was coaching. And I think that the problem is um, that's very hard for logistically for coaches to do it's very hard for for interns to do and i think it does come to a certain point where i think that it's hard to be very selective about an internship because i always say okay if you're not going to take this unpaid internship you know how many paid internships do you have working for you i mean do you have do you have anything like going on right now do you have like can you can you take a paid internship well you should take that one and the problem is they don't this is the only option they have they might have two you know, being paid nothing and being paid less than nothing are their two options. And again, you're right. At some point, they have to have that that clock in their head that says, "Okay, at some point, I need to go ahead and make my own my own path." Whether that be, you know, at the at the high school level, whether that be in the private sector. And I think what you're seeing is, at least in the states, is you're seeing a lot of private sector trying to come up with this college style internship process, and and it doesn't fit exactly. But there's starting to be some other places where people can go. But at the end of the day, when you when you look at it, people in the states want to be a college strength coach or a professional strength coach because they look at high school and the only way they can actually you know sustain is if they're actually a teacher or have another job. You know, there's not too many. It depends regionally, but there's only a few regions in the United States that have full time strength and conditioning coaches that only do PE classes and do strength and conditioning for in season sports. Uh, you know, the same thing with Division Three. I mean, there was just in the state of Ohio, there's about 23 Division Three schools, and only one have a full-time strength coach that only does strength and conditioning. Um, so if there's 22 other sports that really have basically disvalued that, they've undervalued that position. Um, so I think at some point, you know, and if you have the private sector, now you can do what you want. If you're if you own your own business, but now you have the business aspect, or you have the actual sales aspect, where now you have to go ahead and and and, and try to convince people to to come to your facility and pay you. Now they're paying you to train them, and now all of a sudden that's a different dynamic than okay, this is your coach and you're going to do what he says, and or this is the coach that you need to pay to you know if you want to get better. Now you have a, a whole sales and convincing them that that is the right path to, you know that that they're taking. So. Uh, the options to get out of the strength and conditioning, whether it be college or, or, or professional in the States, um, is really, really tough to do because you're going to sacrifice other things in order to do that. But at the same time, uh, you know, um, if you can pay your rent um, and still train athletes, and I think people need to get, uh, they need to get away from the logo aspect. You know, I'm going to, you know, um, it's, it's one of those things where people want to, you know, the name on their shirt, you know, if they can go to a conference with, with a professional or, or major college on their shirt, all of a sudden that's going to give them the, you know, the, the accolades that they're looking for. And really at, at the end of the day, it's about getting athletes to become people that they couldn't be without you. Uh, and once you lose sight of that, that's when you end up looking back and say, okay, I've been, I haven't made, I haven't made a dime of strength and conditioning in the last three years. It's time for me to, how long are you going to bartend and, and, and be a strength coach at the same time? Well, at what point does that say, okay, and I think that's based on the individual, but it's everybody's responsibility 
And the last point, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going on, but the last one about the universe themselves with the strength conditioning exercise science programs, I think that's really hard to, that's really hard to put it on them because, um, you know, uh, one of the smartest people I know, Trevor Cashy, um, I got a chance to talk to him at the Arnold, and one thing he said that I'll never forget was that, you know, an exercise science degree can say that you know how exercise works. It doesn't say how that you know how to exercise. That's a different dynamic altogether, and as you know, you can talk about biomechanics and deadlift all you want, but until you grab that bar, it's it's a little bit different, a little bit different animal. And I think that's where there's a gap there between the practical and the and, and, and the theoretical, and, and and it's not necessarily the college's um, responsibility to do that. That solely, I think, is on the actual strength coach to say that they know. And again, they're able to go to different universities, different, different, you know, different organizations, and still be able to be adaptable enough to adapt and, and to adapt and to adhere to the training philosophy of the head guy. And I think that the only thing you can do that is, is just more experience. Yeah, I can't disagree with, with you there, Mark. I think you know it, the responsibility lies with everyone. Um, I think. Looking at it from a, a UK perspective, you know, something I tried to get across in that article is I think, you know, having a better relationship or partnership between universities and clubs, because obviously collegiate or university sort of settings aren't that popular or aren't that progressive um, in terms of S&C in the UK. It's, again, we're still probably 20, 30 years behind the States in terms of getting that support to our athletes. But... I think if we can then put in place something between, you know, the universities that are producing these graduates and the clubs that are going to be taking them on and say, you know, this is what we can offer you. We can offer you a first year graduate with no experience or a first year student, sorry, with no experience, but they might come down and shadow one time a week and, you know, get used to that environment. And then in the second year, it might grow to, they might do a few nights a week by the time they're sort of the final year or doing a master's, you know, they could be in a, a position where they're in full time or they're on a paid internship, but they've progressed through that. And I think coming back to the, the responsibility that, that lies on everyone is, you know, if you've got a club and you've got people applying for an unpaid internship and you've got someone with four years experience, a master's degree and every other qualification under the sun versus, you know, someone in their second year, you know, you'd be stupid to take that person in the second year when you can get a better candidate and a better coach that's going to add to your system but he's not going to get paid and it, you know it just sort of carries on that cycle of unpaid internships whereas you know if we sort of say that clubs and universities are going to say we're only going to take this person on internship you know we hear it all the time that people are overqualified for roles and bits and pieces but i think we have to be realistic in terms of what we're asking for and if you're asking for three years experience and msc and everything else that, that's not an internship you know, that person is qualified to fulfill full-time work and they should be paid appropriately. So I think between everyone, you know, you've got to strike that balance between universities, between clubs or organisations, institutes and the practitioner themselves. And, you know, be realistic of, at the end of the day, you need to pay your bills. And if you can't do that, then you've got to take a good look at what you're trying to achieve and, you know, ask yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? Because, you know, I, I've been in that position as an unpaid intern for a year and, you know, I was thankful that my parents could help me out and I could live at home and I didn't have financial worries. But, you know, not everyone's fortunate enough to be in that position. And, you know, they slog away long hours for minimal pay and you, you maybe get a bit of kit and lunch. And, like, it, it's not worth it for that. And, you know, it, it's a sad way to sort of see it going. And hopefully we can nip it in the bud before, you know, too many people get lost to this profession because... They get disillusioned of I've worked for free and no one wants to hire me. So, you know, I'll go and find a different role that's going to pay me more money that requires less experience and less qualifications is, is the harsh reality of it. So who, whose job is that to pull all that together? So you've got the, the, the coaches themselves. You've got the, the clubs, colleges, potential private sector. Um, and you've got... Uh, the governing bodies and you've got the kind of UKSCA, SCA, NSCA. Who's going to, who's going to join all them dots? Is it the, is it the job of the UKSCA to make a stand and, and, and say that if you're, if you're advertising for X person, he deserves X amount. 
I, I think it lies wider than that. I think it lies within the strength and conditioning community. You know, we've got to kick up a fuss and, you know, I know coaches that work at clubs, that work at institutes, that hire, you know, coaches, Mark will know coaches, you know, if we can get a consensus across the board that actually, you know, this isn't the best way to be doing it, we can then put pressure on, you know, if we know lecturers and we know people hiring and we know people sitting on the association's board, you know, we've got to drive it as a profession to, to the individual parties and, you know, hopefully somewhere they meet in the middle. But I, I don't think it works if you put the onus on just one individual sort of organisation there because then they'll be seen of probably stepping on someone else's toes or there'll be agendas. Whereas if we as a profession go, you know what, you know, unpaid internships aren't the way to go. We need to do something about it. Let's sit down, you know, maybe through the UKSCA or NSCA and, you know, draw up a plan or have some guidelines that if we are going to take internships or workplace students or, you know, people just shadow. And this is a rough idea of what we want to provide. And, you know, ultimately, okay, we're probably going to struggle because we do have a lot of coaches in those positions that I worked unpaid, you must work unpaid, but people like ourselves that are coming through now, you know, when we get into those positions to hire, I think like that's one of my biggest worries is that if I get into a position to hire and then I don't have the budget to bring on an intern or a paid, you know, part-time staff, then, you know, do I have to resort to unpaid internships, you know, to give people experience? It's not a position I want to be in and I understand it's tough sort of for everyone involved. So I, I don't think there's a, a definitive answer in there, but I think, you know, the conversations having been had now, obviously me and Mark have written about it. We're having this conversation now, like it's getting more and more attention. It's just hopefully it's a snowball effect that, you know, will eventually sort of catch on and we will see some change, but I don't know, it's a tough one, mate. Hope you enjoyed part one with Mark and Aiden. In part two, we get into a bit more chat around why Mark decided that the strength and condition industry wasn't for him anymore, which is a really interesting chat. And also round up with uh, both Mark and Aidan giving their views on what coaches can do to help themselves and what the industry can do to help them. So really interesting little um, end note from them two guys. So just moving forward, um, as you've probably seen on Twitter, or hopefully seen on Twitter, uh, the Pace Performance Podcast has a new home, and it is at strengthofscience.com. So with regards to subscriptions to podcasts, nothing changes, uh, nothing changes on iTunes, etc. But what it will do is just give me a better platform to be able to create some cool new content, which I'm hoping that I've done already a little bit with the audio abstracts. So if you jump over to strengthofscience.com, and just have a little look around, uh, have a little look on the audio abstracts page. Hopefully there is something there which will uh, which will keep you interested and I'd love to hear people's feedback. Just before we get back into part two, massive thanks to Vald Performance, makers of the Nord Board, for sponsoring this episode today. Be sure to check them out at valdperformance.com. So here is part two, hope you enjoy. I mean, one, one thing that I was... The, that I can think of when there was a there was a discussion um, somewhere down the line on on Twitter somewhere, and it's really you know it's difficult for people because an organisation, a club, whatever you want to call it, doesn't have enough money to pay a member of staff, but they need help, and it always comes back to what I was kind of brought up as with mum and dad was if you don't have the money, you just you don't you don't get it. Yeah, like you don't get on a credit card, like you don't get a credit card because that's not your money. So why would an organization expect just because they don't have budget that they're entitled to more staff? You're not entitled to more staff because you haven't got any money. So you don't get a member of staff. If you get more money, then you get a member of staff. Does that make sense? And I, yeah. I just don't get the argument that you're entitled to it because you are whoever you are yeah. or whoever you think you are. You know what I mean? But, uh, that really frustrates me. I, I think men, if you like, you know, if you need it bad enough, you'll find a way. And okay, you might not be able to hire someone full time and pay them, but then that's why you go to university and strike exactly. up this conversation be like, okay, I can't pay anyone, but you know, give me a, a first year student and we'll give them some on the job experience, some education and guide them. And in return, they'll provide a service and everyone then gets a good deal you know the student gets experience the club get what they want the university is then producing someone that can then go and get employed you know it's a win-win like it shouldn't be that difficult 
But yeah, it's been, it's been everything you means, really, isn't it? Rob, the problem you just explained was was me to a T. That was I made. That was the thing that made. I thought, you know, I just I I had so many sports, like five hundred athletes. I need people to help me, and I don't have the money to do it. And, um, and it was the biggest mistake I made. You know, I remember I remember having a, a you know a, a young man, uh, Stephen Mackin, came over from Ireland. Um, here's this guy. He's in the states. He comes over. I find him. I do pay a deposit on you know on his apartment, um, and then I get him a job at Elm's Pizza, and next thing you know, he's working the pizza during the day, and he's training athletes, you know, training athletes during the day, and working at a pizza shop at night, and, and, and yeah, he got experience, but I don't know, I mean, you know, I just thought that, you know, paying people in t-shirts, so that was that was it, and I think toward the end there, we started to get more undergraduate students, so it became more of a practicum, as opposed to an internship, uh, even the students from other universities, uh, because being in Columbus, Ohio, we have so many schools just in our area, and if they can't internship at Ohio State University, um, you know, we were kind of like the, the the farm league, I guess, and we would have we had actually a, a deal with Ohio State with the Olympic sports, and sometimes if if they didn't have room for them, they would send them to us, and you know that could lead to another. And again, that was another situation. Like if you do a good job for me, then you can go back to the original place you applied for, and it was it was kind of ridiculous, but um, when we made it more of a class. More of an academic, you know, which and people don't understand when you put have an internship, if if that doubles your workload for each intern you have, and if it's not, then you don't want an internship like that. You don't want to take an internship where that head coach or the owner of the business isn't going to sit down with you daily, weekly, and go through and evaluate you and help you and teach you, um, you know, and it's like it, it becomes a rite of passage. But to, 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 to piggyback off of, of what Aid was saying about the responsibility of, say, the organizations like, and that's what you asked about, Rob, was, uh, uh, you know, say, say the NSCA. You know, the NSCA, I think, is a little bit not in a position of power as we would like them to be. This is no, I mean, they've done a lot when it comes to networking and, and education. Um, they really have. Uh, but the problem is, I know that the NSCA, for example, this is a couple years ago when I was still at Denison. It might have been 2011. Um, and I know that we, the, the NSCA sent a letter out to every single Division Three, which is over, I think, close to four or five hundred schools um, in the nation, that they, their strength coach, whoever's working with athletes, should be certified. Um, and I know that you know a couple of us signed it. And, you know, we basically, um, you know, put that idea out there. And then a few years later, the NCAA, the the governing body of, of collegiate athletics in the states. Um, they had a rule where if you were going to work with athletes in a sports performance basis, you need to be certified by a national organization. And what we thought was all of a sudden that's going to create more jobs, but it actually didn't. Um, it devalued our position even more because what these athletic directors did was they looked at their budget and said, I don't have the money for this. So I'm going to make my, whoever it may be, my football coach, my athletic trainer, my baseball coach, my basketball coach, if they get certified, then they could be assistant strength coaches and train all the other sports as well. We may give them a couple more money and said, you know, um, you know, just adding, you know, more responsibilities and hey, we can give you another thousand dollars so you can, but you're going to double your workload. That's the Division Three way it seemed like, um, but that's what they did. So all of a sudden now, you had people that got either they had a weekend certification. I know that's kind of cliche, but that's exactly what they did. They got their certification. They were allowed to train their athletes, and problem solved. It created no jobs for strength and conditioning coaches, uh, and it probably put these because now, um, you know, it put some people that are just new enough to be dangerous, put them in positions where not only they're training their own sports, but they're training, you know, they're training other people's sports. And I think it's one of those things that, um, you know, you would never, never go to a, a rugby practice and say, okay, here's a practice plan, go ahead and do it. But yet, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, we have a lot of sport coaches that just want a program, and you have some strength, you know, some 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 coaches in very high levels that they don't care what that sport, what that strength and conditioning coach knows. They just want to hire their guy. They want to hire a guy they can trust, and that's a hard factor. It's good no matter what. Even if you make, you know, you limit to five coaches like they do in Division One football, or they make sure that they have to be certified. Um, there's ways to get around it, and and I think that, that that's part of the problem is that the NSCA is limited. The NCAA even mandated that they would highly suggested that they have a they're, they're certified. They must be certified. It went from highly suggested to must be certified, and people just looped all around it, 
uh, and it did nothing for our profession. Um, and again, it just goes back to they are not the ones, strength coaches are not the ones paying the bill. So the problem is I think we're all on the same page within our own profession, but it has to go outside of that. And I think that the more and more I think, if you go to footballscoop.com, I guarantee you go on that and I guarantee you'll see the strength conditioning, the job board, and you'll see unpaid internship, no monetary you know, benefits. And it goes through, again, you'll get experience in a letter of recommendation. And, and, and you go through the list and there's not, if you want to get the best interns in the country, you just give them housing, you just put them in a dorm room and you'll get like the, and that's the best internship in the country. Regardless of, of level, and people have to figure that out um, because everything else is that unpaid internship and they just keep advertising and advertising and advertising. And it could, it could happen where you say, okay, we're not going to advertise these positions. If you want to have someone volunteer for you, then, you know, then, then go ahead and, and and you can communicate that on your own. But the fact is that, that every job, every straight and initiative job on the board is usually an unpaid internship, which, you know, and people will jump on it. And, and, and because, again, that's, that's all they have. I mean, I did it. I had two unpaid internships, but I had a full-time job, and I was on a 10-month, 9-month, 10-month contract. So I was able to do it. Without that, there was no way I could. Um, and again, do I know that those two internships got me the next position? I, I have no idea. Uh, and it's, it's hard for, for people to really figure that out. I think, obviously... The one thing that I wanted to... Um, oh, go on, mate. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, obviously, similar to the, the position the UKSCA is in, they can't push too much. And one of the things that a couple of the board members said to me at, at the AGM when I raised issues around this is like we can't push too hard too soon because potentially we'll get doors closed in our faces and lose that opportunity. And I think, you know, that is a reality of, you know, we have to tread reasonably carefully in how we go about this. But I think, again, we, we have to utilize what we've got and that's the people that we know that are in jobs at the minute and try and, you know, develop it from the inside out and then push it up the chain. So um, obviously a UK example here is that um, I think it was academy uh, clubs at the, in the Premier League, all of their sports scientists now have to be bases accredited. And, you know, if you're not bases accredited, you're not getting a job in there. And it, it's a small stepping stone, but, you know, hopefully that opens the door. You know, we've got chartered physios. You can't be a physio without being a chartered physio. You can't be a sports scientist in academy Premier League clubs now um, if you're not bases, you know. Hopefully the next step is, you know, we aren't going to hire S&C coaches that aren't accredited with the UKSCA, the NSCA, ASCA. You know, that's where I think, like I've said before about raising the minimum, you know, if you then say you have to be qualified to this level, okay, now you've set the minimum that you have quality candidates that meet that, that base level. And then hopefully with that is, you know, you get paid because you're qualified. On the flip side is, like you said, Mark, is you, you get people and you find ways around it and people don't get paid. So, you know, it's trying to find that balance that we, we can get where we need to go, but without shooting ourselves in the foot in the process. One thing I wanted to ask is, is, is geared towards, well, focused at Mark really. And what, what point did you think, I've had enough of this, I'm, uh, I'm out? Ooh, um... Good I, I know exactly what it was. It was after the season in 2012. Um, I was working, I was, a, I was an assistant football coach, and I was a strength and conditioning coach for all 23 sports. So I was also recruiting, and, and we were doing our, our end of the year. Um, we had a banquet, so it's December. And keep in mind, I had worked, um, at one point I worked, I think, 127 out of 132 days in a row. I worked like 90-some days in a row. Um, and my shortest day was about eight hours on Sundays, we'd have a short day. And, um, and I remember just, it was one of those things, the season's over and here I am, and we had some audio visual issues. And, uh, next thing you know, I'm spending all this time away from home and it's after the season. And, uh, I remember my wife just told me, she said, listen, you, and of course I was frustrated and like a lot of strength coaches do. And there's, there's a couple of frustrations that are pretty, pretty consistent. It's, you know, time away from home, job security, um, the long distance thing, if you're a young strength coach and you're away from home or you're away from, you know, girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, um, there's, there, there's a certain, you know, frustrations that most strength coaches share. Um, and this one, you know, I remember she said, said, listen, Mark, you don't make enough money and you work too many hours to be miserable at your job. 
and it, it hit me. It's like, you're right. And, and I know, and it, the, the final straw was, I knew when we got a new athletic director, and this is no nothing against her. I mean, but the head football coach at work for me, he's my oldest daughter's godfather, he's my mentor, he's my guy. Um, but it was not fair to him, too, because I was spending half my time with other sports doing strength and conditioning. If you're not making recruiting calls, you're in the weight room. If you're, you know, if you're not in the weight room, you're making recruiting calls. And it, that was one of those, one of those things where it was, I was, all of a sudden I became a, a, a average football coach and an average strength coach. And I knew I was better than that, but I didn't have time to be better than that. Uh, and then the, the, the final straw was I knew that the athletic director was not going to split my position. She wasn't going to hire a football guy and let me just do strength and conditioning. So I knew in 10 years I would still be doing the same thing. Um, maybe making a little bit more money. The hours were not going to change. It's just that's just the nature of the job, especially when you look at American football and a lot of sports for that matter. Um, it wasn't going to change. So I knew I had to make the decision, and I decided to. I, I Dave gave an opportunity to, to be the you know the, um, the director of education at Elite FTS, and it gave me an opportunity to write. It gave me an opportunity to kind of step back and try to help coaches because I made a lot of mistakes, and I tried to do my best and try to help those other coaches when they're in the situation. Um, and 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 I, that was he gave me a platform to do so, and I'll always be grateful to him. Um, and then I, I I just missed teaching, I missed coaching, and I needed some. And I just uh, without being corny, it just it was kind of a a higher power kind of put me just right in the position I am right now, and this is kind of where I need to be, I think, for the next you know. And, and the, the fact that I can still help people because I, you know I take I, I I really it's it gets I'm emotionally attached to the profession. Um, and I see these coaches. I've known good friends that, you know, all of a sudden are driving across the country in a U-Haul uh, and have to turn it around. Um, you know, they get a call on their cell phone as they're going to a job or they get to a job and they're there for three months and they get let go. And, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I see the actual, you know, I look at it. You get, this is moving day for us strength coaches and, and, and a lot of college strength coaches. You know, this is you all day where they're packing up because the football coach got fired and you're attached to him. And, and that's what, you know, and that's why a lot of coaches trying to not attach themselves to a sport. So it's a, it's a double edged sword because you're attached to that sport. You're good. You know, you're good if the team's good, but you're attached to that coach. And all of a sudden that coach has a bad year. You know, all of a sudden now you're, 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 you're moving and you're back on the, in the starting block trying to, trying to secure another position. And, um, you know, with 10, 20 years experience. And I think that's, you know, for me, that's when I knew it was, you know, I knew it was time. And, and, and I, I just, I'm, I'm lucky that I can speak at a conference here and there and write an article and be on a podcast. And uh, especially when people run out of people they interview, you know, I'm, 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 I'm like the backup, you know, they can get me up there. <laughs> but, but seriously, it's one of those things where, you know, when we started, there was no one to tell us this stuff. You know, and right now they just get bombarded with all this stuff. This is with all these new techniques and, 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 and technology. And it's like, no, 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 it's not about that. You know, it's still going to be about people. It's still about those people you impact. And, um, and I think sometimes young coaches can lose sight of that. Um, and like I said, with, uh, you know, my, my friend Ryan Horn, who's at Wake Forest, and he said, you know, be big time where you're at. Wherever you are, and it might have been Adam Fight, I don't know, I'm just misquoting people, name dropping, but, um, <laughs> you know, they, they just, you know, and that's kind of the be big time where you're at. The best thing you can do to get that next position is to do the great job at the position you're in. You can't control. You can't control anything else except for the job you're doing right now today. And I think that's when I knew that if I couldn't do the best job, I possibly could. I got to the position I was because I worked, worked my butt off and... I, 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 when, when it came to the point where I couldn't do that, I didn't have an advantage over anybody else, and I, I wasn't satisfied with what I was doing because, um, you know, it, it came back to not being able to invest the time, and I wasn't willing to. So that's kind of where I I end up, uh, you know, jumping ship and, and trying to stay. You know, at some point I'm not going to be relevant, and I'll have to kind of, you know, sail to the sunset and uh, leave it to some other people. But you know, as long as I can help young coaches. Uh, I'll, I'll continue to, to help them as much as I can. Cool. So I just want to, um, I just want to round up there, but I'm just going to give, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to say a minute then, but I think that's a little bit harsh. But A, just, just to round up, what can we do as, I should say, what can you do <laughs> as coaches? <laughs> what can you do as coaches to, 
help yourselves and the profession um, based on what we've just said? I think in terms of helping yourself, you know, I think it's a lesson I learned along the way as well is make sure that you are qualified and educated enough to go for these jobs because after I left my first job, you know, I found that harsh reality if I wasn't equipped to, to really go into these other jobs. So, you know, nail down, you know, what it is you need to learn to work in these environments. Um, I think, again, one of the things I struggled with was a pathway of how to get into this profession and, and to progress. I think if you're a student now, you know, sit down and realistically look at what you need to do and where you need to go to get to where you want to get to go and plan that out, you know. It's three years at university, it's probably a master's degree, but it's seeking the experience across multiple sports, you know, reaching out to people and trying to learn that way. And, you know, as a, as a profession as a whole, you know, I think we've just got to keep having that conversation and I don't think it's going to be a fast process, but I think, you know, the people in our situation at the minute have come through the time we've come through. When they get into positions of recruiting and, you know, being able to make these decisions is you know, remember how it felt to be in this position and, you know, have some integrity and, you know, stay true to what we feel now. And that's the frustration um, that is trying to get into these, these jobs and the situations we're faced with. And I think the coaches that have probably come before us is, you know, I think as a coach, if you're in that position, you've probably got, you know, sons and daughters. I think the one thing for me is, do you want your children who've gone through education that forked out I think it could be up to like £36,000 now. Do you want them to do all of that to then go and work for free for a year? You know, it sucked having to do that and tell my dad, okay, I've, I've got an undergrad, I've got a master's, but I'm having to go and work for free because I'm not experienced enough to work in this profession. You know, I think it's, it's one of those, you know, just have that conversation with yourself and be like, is this really what's best for the profession? It might suit your club in the short term, but that person's going to be gone in another year and you're going to have someone else in that position, you know. Let's try and get some sustainability and you know, continuity in the process and develop these coaches as, as we come through and, and read the blog. That's a plug there. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder now, it's taken 50 minutes. Hey, it's 50 good. minutes. <laughs> <you> say that. <laughs> but both blogs though, you know, not just mine and Mark's, but some really good stuff as well. Yeah, so. 100%. Absolutely. So where can, uh, oh, this is, this is just cringe. It's like we've set this up. Where can, um, where can people keep in touch with what you guys have got going on? Mark first to, to, <laughs> kind of move away from Aiden's plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am. Uh, I'm on. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I think Twitter and Instagram is Coach underscore MJ Dubs MJ D U B S. Um, and and that's an easy way to, to, to get a hold of me. Um, my email is strength dot coach dot education at gmail dot uh, com. And I know that's a little longer, but and then uh, if you go to leadfds dot com. My author page is on there. I try to, you know, write that it wasn't necessarily a timely. Uh, there's not a lot of rants on there. It's, it's that I try to be as practical as I can with that. So any of my older stuff, uh, you know, webinars and, and, and whatnot, they're all on my, my author page on on Elite FTS. And, and like I said, any anytime anybody has any questions, I'll do my best to get to you and um, and, and, and try to help in any way I can. Sounds good, Aid. Uh, Twitter's probably the best one for me, so I'm at AJ Oakley, like the sunglasses. Um, there's a link to the few blog posts that I've done and that Rich has put on there as well. Um, hopefully I'll churn out some more useful information sort of over the next coming months, kind of related to this as well. Um, but yeah, hit me up on Twitter, I spend enough of my time on it, you know, if anyone wants to reach out with questions, suggestions and just to keep this issue going and try and develop it and find solutions. Um, then yeah, hit me up on that and I'll try and get back to you as quickly as I can. Obviously some of us coach now, Rob, so we're a little bit busier than sales teams. Don't even tell me you're busy. <laughs> right, thanks guys. Really appreciate your time. Just stay on the line. I'll just have a little chat with you after Thank just two seconds. Cheers, Rob. But, um, thanks again for your time. Thanks for tuning in to episode 114 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So just a reminder, the Pacey Performance Podcast has a new home, and that is at strengthofscience.com. So nothing changes with the podcast, uh, just a little new home for, for the podcast to uh, get settled in. So no iTunes changes, um, subscription and things still stay the same. So I can be found on there at 
Strength of Sai, so S C I at the end, uh, on Twitter. So all the kind of uh, normal stuff will get migrated across there within time. Uh, but make sure you check that out and your feedback will be appreciated as always. So massive thanks to Vald Performance for sponsoring the episode today. So be sure to check them out and everything to do with the Nord board at valdperformance.com. So thanks again and I will speak to you in episode 115.